Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad of Damar, together with my co-host Mark Ronich with Statewide News Service and jbiztechvalley.com. We have a very, very special guest with us, Assemblyman Steve McLaughlin. Can I call you Steve? Absolutely. Steve, Absolutely. welcome to The Jewish View. Thank you. It's a Jewish pleasure to be back. You. Yeah. Good to have you back. Thank you. So, how, was, um, how are things going down at the Capitol? Well, it's, it's been great, uh, kind of the off-season for us. We're getting ready to go back into session in just a few days. What are you uh, expecting to happen in 2014? I think it's going to be a very, uh, a very uh, tense session is what I, what I think. Uh, we'll see. Hopefully not. Is it because not. it's an election year? I think it's always added tension when it's election year. You always have that added stress and tension on all the members as, uh, as they try to get reelected if they choose to. Uh, seek re-election, but also there's just such turmoil down there uh, throughout this past session, and I think it's going to spill over into this session. On top of that, we have a gubernatorial election coming up in November as well, so it's, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of stress between the legislature and the governor, and, and I think it'll be both sides. I think uh, the governor may be arguing with both the Republicans and the Democrats. And you're up for re-election, the whole entire state legislature is up for re-election. Uh, planning on running again? I am planning on running again. Uh, you know, if I, yeah, if I don't seek a different office, I plan on running again for the assembly. But at this point, I think it's probably, as I said in today, is probably what you're getting at in the paper today. I am. It's it's likely that I will seek re-election to the assembly, and a little more unlikely that I would seek uh, the, the governor's spot. And that's because of the amount of money you'd have to fundraise in a short period of time? Well, it's that. It's, uh, that that's probably the number one overwhelming yeah. thing. Uh, it's just an enormous amount of money. And if you don't have that um, institutional money, if you will, yeah. uh, some of the big the players. The usual suspects. The usual suspects. <laughs> they have to get behind you. And, uh, you know, we have, I will say this, I think I have enormous grassroots support in upstate New York. I think we would dominate uh, this governor in upstate New York. I think I would win pretty much every county in upstate New York. But that being said, you have to get your message out to the folks downstate. And that's very difficult to do. And I've, the analogy I've used many times is if I'm the car, that money is the gas. And I can't leave the driveway without enough gas to make the trip. And uh, it's just, uh, it's frustrating because in my heart of hearts, I want to run. Uh, but my head tells me that you have to have. It's always the lieutenant to governor. If you have someone downstate, maybe, and you know, a downstate person, and you'd be a good life. But no one yeah. runs for lieutenant governor. Yeah, you yeah. don't really run really. for the, you know. The, yeah. Unless there's a primary of lieutenant governors, which they never. It hasn't happened since 1982. Right. <laughs> you typically, you know, get picked by whoever the the candidate is. So. You know, I haven't made a firm and final decision, but I think it's just likely that yeah. I won't be able to raise enough. But uh, who, if, if you can't do it, yeah. uh, you know, who can? I mean, uh, you know, you have a Rob Astorino mm -hmm. who's Westchester County Executive. Mm -hmm. Now, coincidentally, when Mario Cuomo's first re-election came up, it was Andy O'Rourke who was the Westchester County Executive at the time yeah. who ran against him. Yeah. So now that for the first re-election of the Cuomos, they're going to Westchester County's executive yeah. and they're asking, looking at him to run. Yeah. But he also has six, you know, six months, seven months to raise thirty million dollars. Right. I mean, how does you know if he you can't do it? What makes him more apt to be able to do it? Well, I, not to speak for Rob. Um, Just philosophically. Philosophically, yeah. he, he, the access from Westchester down to Wall Street is a lot shorter distance. He may have more uh, contacts and more ability to raise it, but that doesn't mean that he can. He just might have a little more ability to raise it than I do. Um, you also have party support. It does appear clear to me that clearly the, the GOP, at least the, 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 the head of the GOP, seems to be pushing uh, for Rob to run. And Rob's a good guy. I have nothing uh, mm -hmm. but respect for Rob. He and I have spoken on the phone a few times, and uh, I think we'll probably meet and have lunch or coffee shortly here and talk a little bit. Uh, because whether I'm in that race or not, uh, I do carry a pretty big voice upstate with a large segment of the population. So I think I have a role to play, whether I'm on the ticket or not. Uh, and, but one thing I think is clear, and I said this from the beginning, when this all sort of came about this past summer, I said, I'll, I'll consider it. Yeah. yeah. In June, I said, you know, if I think I can raise enough money, then I will, will run. And I, it's sad and it's frustrating that money is such a factor in politics today. But it is, and especially when you're looking 
at an opponent that has $30 million already right. and, and an opponent that has no problem telling people, don't give them any money or I'm going to put you on my enemies list. Uh, that becomes very daunting for a lot of people who do business with state government, that they're afraid exactly. to contribute. Chris Jester uh, anyway has more more influence but community. He, but, but more or less, I mean, if people are going to give to a Republican candidate for governor, they're going to give to a Republican candidate for governor yep. if, that is, if that person's not a Pierre Infray right. or... Uh, uh, Paladino, mm -hmm. or someone who's off the, you know, off the <coughs> deep end, right. and you know, you're a sensible guy. Astorino's a sensible guy. There's other sensible people, mm -hmm. but you know, to look at a Donald Trump who can self-finance, that doesn't bring the rank and file GOP closer to wanting to say this is my candidate. It's like, oh, here's the guy running, and now we you know Galasano had the same problem. Uh, you know, no, no one felt close and near and dear to him. And that was the problem. They all felt they didn't feel invested, and that's what fundraising is all about. You get people to feel invested, and that's and that's the issue. And I, wow, you, know. you, you just nailed it exactly correct. That is a hundred percent spot on, and that has been uh, my warning to the GOP, if you will, is that you can't just run uh, just another rich guy that can self fund. Uh, not that there's anything, I'm not saying anything no. against Donald Trump or Galasano or anybody else. We would never else. do that. You have to run a man of the people out there, somebody that looks comfortable in jeans and a sweatshirt, that can go out to the farm, but can also sit there and talk to a CEO. You need that man of the people type of mentality. And that's where it really holds me back a little bit, because I do think if I announce, there are a lot of people that would say, this is a guy we can get behind. Here's my $25 or here's my $50. So I do still wrestle with this. I mean, I've been praying about this every day for six months. It weighs on my mind constantly because in some ways I feel like I'm called to do it, that I have to step up and try to, what I view as try to save this state because we are heading in the wrong direction in a lot of different areas. Uh, exact opposite of what the governor says. We're not recovering. Florida just passed us in population. We're declining, not gaining. Well, we're just not gaining as fast as Florida. That's true. Okay, we're gaining, but not as fast. Not as fast, which so means we're, we're declining. I mean, we're... Well, we it are, just means that w that's why we're being overtaken. I don't want to that's make it true. seem like we're not... Well, that is true, but there's also no doubt that there's an exodus of people out of New York State, especially upstate, upstate. from the top right. down. Let's say from Westchester north. Uh, upstate is suffering. Uh, and I think that I have a role to play there. Now, what I wrestle with internally is, is my role better served staying in the assembly and being the voice that I am, uh, or do I go for the governorship and you risk it all? Well, um, I, have a, a, I have an idea for you. Okay. You have a banking background. I do. You're good with finances. Any idea of opposing Tom DiNapoli for controller. <laughs> That's an interesting, someone else had mentioned that to me uh, and truthfully I had not <laughs> given that a ton of thought. Hey, it doesn't so. take much money, it's much low, lower profile. Yeah. And I'm sure Andrew Cuomo would love that if I and was if suddenly you, the controller. And of if New you York ran State. for controller then, you know, I mean there are people who've exceeded from controller to, I mean Ned Regan was controller for many years mm -hmm. and then in 82 he took a shot to try to run for governor. Yeah. That's it's That's not, happened. It's not the. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> okay. You always have good ideas. <laughs> yeah, well, think good. about it. Yeah, yeah, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> Let me go back to the issues. Like, I mean, there's major issues. Maybe it's a dead issue now. But like, for example, I know fracking mm. has been. I mean, it's dead because the governor is if he's not going to give his okay, it's dead in the water. Yeah. But still, I don't know if maybe the people behind it. I mean, I'm not an expert to say the least. I always say I'm a rabbi, and I start telling about finances or. You know, you're you're more on the ball than I am. You're the, in the assembly, to say the least. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying that to me, it's just you know, that I've heard more jobs, more money. Like you're saying, it is a problem upstate. Yeah. And that may be the cure. I mean, I have people on my back. I said that a few people in the street. Say, oh, but the pollution. You don't know, Rabbi. Yeah. I says, well, you know, again, I'm not going to say I'm an authority on anything. And there's always two sides to every story, but. Well, there is, and, and my approach to fracking has been uh, proceed with caution, but proceed. You can't just be dead in the water when 29 other states, uh, the Middle East is fracking, mm -hmm. England is fracking, even California. I mean, as far left right. as California is, Jerry Brown has said we can do this. Barack Obama and his EPA says we can do this. It can be done safely. And We're America. We can do anything we set our mind to. And we haven't said no in New York State. We haven't said no. We just won't, he, the governor won't make a decision. It's interesting that he says, well, maybe by election day of 2014. 
This is all about, not about the safety. The report is done. And he wants the issue and not the solution. That's and right. And that's what his father always said about the Republicans. They want the issue and not the solution. And I think that's what's going on here with fracking. Because when you have the issue and not the solution, then it's the fun, follow the money. It's all about the money. Yeah, that's and right. And that's what it keeps bringing in, you know, the oil and gas industry, the uh, good government groups, or wh whatever, NYPIRG and others. You know, they, it, they start rallying their forces together, citizen action, and they to, to influence. And it's all about the money. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, the issues... There's what, a lot of money in fracking, too. Well, right? yeah, but that's what happens, you know. So all of a sudden, when the money dries up and you don't give anyone, then the solution comes because then they tally up who gave me more mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. what's the issue. Maybe and before the election and because it'll be such and a that's, hot issue. That exactly, and well, that's he why he said run. maybe by election day. Yeah, by, by election, not yeah. before though. No. And this, yeah. by the way, we were told a year and a half ago that, oh, the report will be done in a few weeks. Well, the report's done. It's been sitting in his desk for a year and a half now. This, to me, has always been about the politics, uh, not of Albany as much as Iowa. This is about the politics yes. of Iowa. He's afraid to roll it out there. He's been told by Bobby Kennedy and Yoko Ono and the, and the, the anti-fracking extremists. Bobby Kennedy, by the way, was a very big fan of natural gas extraction a few short years ago until he discovered solar and wind and started pumping his money into solar and wind, and suddenly natural gas became the enemy. The reality is our greenhouse gas emissions have dropped by 30 percent. The air is cleaner than it's ever been. Uh, in, in recent history, certainly probably in the past 75 to 100 years. That's because we're burning a lot less oil, a lot less coal. This to me is like a gift from God under our feet. And to not use that and to let those people in the southern tier suffer, I mean, this has big national security ramifications. It has ramifications for kids down in New York City that are breathing uh, bad air or have been breathing bad air. That air is now starting to clean up. So it's, uh, the more we can use this natural gas safely, mm -hmm. extract it safely with the right, the right environmental concerns mm -hmm. in mind, of course. You don't just throw the door open and let them do whatever they want to do. Do it safely and let's put these people to work and let's use these I, resources. I have another issue to move on sure. to if I could. Your wife Maggie is a teacher. She is. Yeah. And she taught in the Glenmont School District, but yeah. now she's teaching in the Lansing, at uh, Turnpike Elementary in yeah. Lansingburg. Yeah. Could you, does she come home and tell you about the Common Core? Does she tell you that kids are crying, that there's this uh, mass hysteria, there's too much testing? What does she tell you about the Common Core? She does not, and I think the reason for that is she teaches pre-K. Right. So she has, uh, she's taught kindergarten one, two, and three, but, but now they, it's pre-K. But they have conferences. The teachers still mm -hmm. get together. They still swap stories. They, there's, you know, lunchtime yep. and yep. other there's, times when you could do that. Does she come home and, and relay these stories to you? Well, mostly she would tell you that pretty much every day she's eating in her room because she's running as fast as she can. So there's a lot less time than that there, there used to be. Um, she has not had that bad of an experience with it. Uh, and she says, you know, I'm in pre-K, there's some things in there that are good, and I agree with that. There are some things that are positive, uh, but when you get into the fourth grade and the fifth and the eighth, things like that, that's where we're really seeing a, a huge amount of pushback from a lot of the teachers mm -hmm. saying we're over-testing these kids. So, and what do you think about it? Well, I, I'm of the belief that, uh, first of all, I don't think children are common. I think, you know, I'm a father of two boys. Same parents, completely different children. Yeah. Uh, and I think any parent watching this would say the same thing. I have a couple of kids, they're all different. They're all unique individuals. Sure. So I don't think that commonizing education uh, is the right way to go. And, and that's, to me, it's appropriately named. When they say common core, you try to kind of commonize things. And when I've had education, an education expert say to me, we should know what college a child's gonna go to by the second grade, that's absurd. I mean, there are kids that are late bloomers. Einstein didn't speak till he was almost five, and he did pretty well for himself. So uh, I think that um, there are some good in the Common Core. There are. There are some <coughs> positive things. There isn't anybody out there, any parent, any assemblyman, any nobody, wants to see our education decline. We obviously want to see it go up. But is this the way to go, or is this just the latest, greatest, new, shiny toy in education, much like Race to the Top and, and um, No mm -hmm. Child Left Behind was? And are we going to waste a decade and then look back and say, well, that didn't work. We have to scrap it. I'm not an expert. As you said, there's some things you're not an expert on. I'm not an expert on education. But I do know that the best way to go about things 
is almost always to let those boots on the ground, let the teachers teach to the children as they need it, not with this commonized, mm -hmm. uh, uh, standardized testing type approach. Now, the region who represents your district, uh, Dr. Jackson, mm -hmm. is up for uh, reappointment, reelection. I'm yeah. not quite sure. But most regions, they kind of they just get reappointed right. if they want to stay in the position. Yeah. Is there going to be more of a competition this year? Are the legislators going to be focused more on these, because Dr. Jackson's not the only one, mm -hmm. there's three others up for re-election. Yeah. So is there going to be more of a focus on this? And are you on the Assembly Education Committee? I am, and okay. we just held a Common Core forum that I hosted with some of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And bipartisan, Pat Fay, sure. he was there, John McDonald was there, Jimmy Tedisco, Lopez. I think I was there. Al Graff, it was <laughs> terrific, you know. Um, so this is a bipartisan issue, and in yeah. years past, you're right, they've sort of been rubber stamped. Uh, the Senate, interestingly, as you know, doesn't even show up for the vote mm -hmm. half the time. They protest the vote. The vote is held in our chamber over in the Assembly, and the Senate doesn't bother to show up. Well, they don't because they feel that they need more of a weighted vote. Exactly. Because they're, they're covering a larger territory, and their vote should be more equal, is not being as equal as the assembly vote. And right, but I would hope that this year that <clears throat> messages are sent and that people show up and say we're voting no or yes, whatever they're going to vote. Sure. But I would hope that this year there's a lot more uh, time taken on yeah. the vote rather than just a rubber stamp. And okay. I think that may be the case. I think you're going to see some competition well, for the positions. Will you be attending the hearings that will be going on? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, good. yeah. we okay. just had a very heated hearing, a very interesting hearing uh, that uh, Chair, uh, Chair Nolan, uh, Catherine Nolan, the in chair December. of the Education Committee, yeah. and to get 15 assembly members to show up in Albany when we're not in session, and that lasted a good four to five hours. And very interestingly, you have me who, you know, would certainly be more on the conservative side of the aisle, and Danny O'Donnell, certainly on the left side of the sure. aisle from New York City saying virtually the same thing. We have real problems with the way this Common Core is being rolled out. I have huge problems with the data mining that's going on with our kids, with the upload of their data that's gonna follow them from kindergarten throughout their whole life. This is, that one thing, that data mining needs to come to a stop immediately, mm -hmm. and I hope that's the first bill that we take up in the new year. What other committees are you on in the assembly? Uh, small business, uh, tourism, uh, banking, uh, and economic development. Do you want to, are you on a leadership track in this, in this, among these Republican conference? Well, I'm on the ranking member on economic development, and I think this year we'll see a little bit of a shakeup because we've lost a few people. Bill Rylick is gone, Annie Rabbit's gone, so some of our senior members are, are not there. Tony there Jordan. Nine people. Nine. Nine assemblymen yes. is gonna be, uh, have left, and that's more in an off election, that's even more of a turnover than in an election year. It is. It's something else. It's really wild. And we may have another one departing soon if, uh, if this continues. So <laughs> as, I, as I've said, we may be in the majority pretty soon if this continues the way it's going. So, um, that so how do you treat your interns? Uh, yeah, I, I am very, <laughs> I, you know, yeah, yeah. very, very straightforward. You know, about straight tourism, ahead. tourism is a big fact, of course, New York City, but yep. even upstate, you know, with the skiing, you know, in the, the summer. Sure. Is it growing? I mean, I don't know anything about, again, the figures, but just, I know it's a very important industry. It is there. very important. Certain industries, uh, certain areas in New York State do very well with tourism, rely heavily on it. Certainly the Finger Lakes, the Adirondacks, but really all areas of upstate New York are reliant to one degree or another on tourism. And we've done some things that are positive. Uh, the expansion of the microbreweries and the wineries, those do play into tourism. People come up for the weekend and visit different breweries or, or, or wineries and take in the sites. That's an important part of what we're doing uh, upstate New York. Um, is that going to be the be-all and end-all? No, but it's certainly a big plus. Well, I have uh, a tourism idea for you that's also economic development. <laughs> well, <it makes laughs> so, so, yeah. You heard of the show The Amazing Race? Yes. Okay, Love that it's show. on CBS. Yes. They go all around the world. Well, we have uh, places around New York State, Cairo, Chi Lai, uh, Madrid, Mexico, you know, Rome. Right here in we New York? We have right here in New York State. So if we do an amazing race starting maybe with Mount Sinai in Long Island <laughs> and ending in Niagara Falls, which is an international city of its own, but you know, we could, try, we could do an amazing race trying to find the international cities, city names in New York State. That's a great idea. And if you can just do with a kiosk and just do a swipe card to show you were there. So A, 
the, the most number of cities or you know, municipalities you would visit, you'd get a prize, maybe a trip to Mohonk House in Ulster County. And the, and the most amount that you bought and spurred on the economy in New York State, maybe you'd get an American-made car like a Cadillac. I like the idea. Okay. Cut that out. I'll so, steal the idea. So you can steal the idea. <laughs> you know, I've been pushing this now for probably a good 10 years. I like that idea. And, and Ken Adams likes the idea. Yeah. He even took the list that I had, and he, and he added a few more names. He got into it. It's a great and idea. And he's head of economic development, but then it just kind of, he didn't do anything with it. That's a great so, idea. So I'm thinking the good. people from all around the world will come to New York State. You'd have them spreading around New York State. They could see... Wow, I went there. I didn't know that was there. I got to come back. Yeah. So the rolling it out and how, you know, you, you don't know what the economic impact will be in future years when you have increased tourism, people talking to other people about how beautiful the state is. Great idea. Okay. That's excellent. You run with it. No, that's really good. I like that. That's <laughs> okay. a fun one. That's that great. That's a very fun yeah. one. It's better than microbreweries. And <laughs> that's great. <laughs> okay. Very good. Um, so what do you hope to achieve in the, you know, in the next year, obviously, mm. the first, in last January, you came out with both guns blazing. I did. I did. <laughs> and I haven't stopped. And you put your foot in your mouth. No, slightly, yeah. <laughs> Once or twice. It happens. And it happens, and it you happens. apologized, yeah. and you were very gracious about, in, yep. you know, and it's not so much what you say, but how you react and yeah. how you do something, you know. Yeah, if you make so, a mistake, you gotta, you know, I apologize, yeah. you, you know, and that, that's and it went life. Away. You know, we've yeah. all made mistakes. Um, but I'm, you know. But, I, but that doesn't back me off of the issue, which I think is, you know, the, the governor's act. still clearly wrong on uh -huh. the SAFE Act. Yeah, I just don't think it, I, I don't think that turning law-abiding citizens into criminals at the stroke of a pen serves any purpose. Uh, but can anything be done in the next session to roll that back a little or to do some tweaking <laughs> on it? Well, my approach to it has been that the, the law is so egregious that I will not agree to any tweaks. Uh, that's been my position. I didn't agree to uh, exempting the police officers, which some of them didn't like, the retired police officers. I'm sorry, I'm not going to nibble away at a law that I believe is the worst bill I've ever seen in my entire time in the assembly. So not like that that's all or nothing, you're saying like to get me, rid of it. I, I want know, the it bill sounds repealed. like you're waffling a little. <laughs> I, want, I want the bill repealed, and so I won't agree. I would, I would not agree to any of the tweaks that we've done so far. Okay. Um, if, if he can't, you know, when he, when we, as we said, and what we were debating on the floor was a, was accurate. Nothing that we were saying was inaccurate. When we said they don't make. Uh, seven round magazines, and we were told, "Well, we're New York; they'll make them." I said, "No, they won't. They won't make them." And, and sure enough, the manufacturer said, "We're not making them." Mm -hmm. So there was a backtrack on that. Uh, the mental health community has come out and said, "We're not going to obey this law. We're not doing it." Why um, wouldn't they? They're very worried about HIPAA requirements and HIPAA uh, restrictions. Uh, so they've Medi told the medical VA, disclosure. Medical, dis medical really disclosures. The VA has said, "We're not going to comply." Uh, so there's, you've never seen pushback like this, really, in the history of New York. You go back to the patroons, you wouldn't right. see pushback like this. There's a reason that 51 counties have stood up and said no to this. And now they're saying, not only are we saying no, you're not going to use our county symbol on anything to push this. So there's county after county is, is just standing up and opposing this. So I think I'm right on this issue, the, especially upstate, that people have had enough of this. Uh, and, and I'm not going to back off. I'm not going to tweak it at all. So any bill that comes before me that mm -hmm. tweaks it, I say no to. Okay, so let me ask you about the, uh, the, the STAR, the, um, the SAFE Act, and what it might mean for the industry, let's say in Herkimer County and Illion. Well, and huge impact. I mean, imagine if, if uh, Remington Arms decides to pack up and leave, and they're owned by a Wall Street firm now, so they, could, they are being courted by other states. Uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, really any other state, Tennessee, they are being courted. If they pack up and leave, it is a death blow to the town of Illion. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope they don't. I hope they stay. But at some point, uh, the dollars uh, speak. And if you're producing a product that is in high demand, yet you can't sell it, you have to ship it to the border of the state that you're located in, you very well may say, you know what, we don't need this anymore, we're going to leave. And the interesting thing with this, uh, Bill, you're already seeing uh, tweaks in the, in the firearms. They're already remanufacturing or mm -hmm. changing the handle. The firearm is the exact same it always was. It just you've changed the shape of the handle and now it's compliant. How did that make anybody safer in any way, in any way, shape, or form? Because you eliminated a pistol grip? All you did was slope it and uh, they just copied what California did. They made them uh, mm -hmm. Safe Act compliant. 
but the firearm is the firearm. That bullet is still coming out at 1,200 feet per second or whatever it's coming out at. Well, I didn't know that. So it doesn't <laughs> change the firearm at all. It just okay. changed the look of it. So, so let me ask you about this uh, problem you had when you had this big rally last January and the ground was soft and they had to resod <laughs> and it cost $60,000. Yeah. I found out, oh, I figured out, I didn't yeah. really verify this, mm -hmm. but they put in new underground sprinklers. Mm -hmm. And right. I don't think that was there. No, that was And wasn't. I think that's why, that's the answer to your, and, and they were stalling you because they didn't want to tell you. Sure. Because you would have gone like, what? Right. You know. What? Well, <laughs> what they did is, you notice they took about three weeks to answer me, so they had plenty of time uh -huh. to make the numbers match the narrative because I also did some math, and you look outside, and it was right outside my window, so I was watching this thing <laughs> transpire, getting madder by the day. And when you take the amount of topsoil that they said they bought, and you know how those curbs are, they're built up, right. you know, they're nice little curbs down there. If you put that much topsoil on top of those, on those enclosed areas, you would have added a, a good six to eight inches of topsoil across that entire area. It would look like a double stuffed Oreo. <laughs> so I said, you know, you may have bought that much topsoil, but, but you've you didn't parked use it. <laughs> two, two, to, you know, two thirds to maybe three quarters of it somewhere else to use. So they made the numbers match the narrative. I could have had that job done with a crew of 10 to 15 guys in a weekend. We would have been in there, stripped it off with a couple of machines, put some topsoil down, roll out the sod, and you're done. And for 20000 probably. At most. At most. At most. I mean, a but, weekend's But now we've got an underground sprinkler system there. So but they then, could turn on the sprinklers when there's a protest that they want to, <laughs> that they want to get rid of. Yeah, that's and, true. And they could turn the sprinklers on yeah, and get rid true. of it. That's and true. And who knows what else they could put in those pipes. You it's know, true. <laughs> but you know what really got me? I mean, you're down there all the time. Yeah. You see the amount of protests that are out there. <laughs> Never before had they blamed damage on a protest. And that park gets used in protests. Yeah, but I'd never seen it that bad either. Well, no, but and it was, that was I mean, I had mud up to up to my oh, yeah. uh, there's thighs no doubt. or whatever. Yeah. yeah, there's no doubt. But to come out and say, well the the you know the, the rally did the damage. <laughs> Well, you're the ones that Blame told them the to weather. hold the rally there. Blame the weather. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you, we, the weather was nicer, it wouldn't have had the problem. It wouldn't have, and we could have held the, <laughs> well, if we hadn't have passed the bill on the first day of session, <laughs> session where we had to rally in the middle of January. Yeah. But, you know, we could have held that rally up on the mall where right. it's all concrete, and it wouldn't have been any problem, but that's exactly where the state said to hold the rally. I see. And at the end of that rally, there was not a, not a coffee cup, there was not a sign, <laughs> there was nothing. There certainly was mud, but there was not a sign, there was not a piece of trash right. anywhere. Everybody well, cleaned looks up. looks nice now. Let me ask this, do you have an aspiration, may, if you don't do the, na the statewide scene, to be maybe minority leader? Uh, well, you never know. And you the can't insult holds. Brian Kolb, I no, know that. I, but, I, I have no you know. problem with, with Brian's uh, leadership. Brian. Right. Everybody has their own style, and Brian certainly has his. And you know what? To his credit, he lets us be us. Right. You know, I am a totally different animal than somebody from Long Island might be. Right. But he handles us uh, in a very good way. And he always says this, you vote what's best for your district. That's your job. He never, ever says, I need you to vote this way. There's no arm twisting. You vote how you're going to vote. So that's to his credit. So uh, I don't have any problem with Brian's leadership. Uh, he's, it's a bit like herding cats, dealing with all of us. Yeah, but couldn't he do better in terms of fundraising to put more money in the coffers of, of challengers to the Democratic seats? Well, it's difficult, certainly difficult to raise money as in the minority. But I will say, I think he's, he's trying. He's doing a pretty decent job. We've okay. had more money than we had in years past, so mm -hmm. he's done a pretty good job of that. It's difficult. It's always difficult to raise mm -hmm. money. And nobody likes doing it, at well, least... There's I don't a, like doing it. There's that. a guy, Jim Emery, who was the minority leader in the 80s, and he also ran for governor, but I don't recall. Rapplier didn't run, and, uh, well, Faso was minority leader. He ran for governor, mm -hmm. but I don't recall anyone else, really. Certainly before my time. Before your time. Yeah, See, I go way back. Time. I'm yeah. so old. I was flying <laughs> airplanes back then. I don't yeah. know. I was flying planes. But it, uh, give him a blessing. Yeah. All right. So we have to conclude now, but we, you're always invited back. Thank that's you. for sure. But we want to give you a blessing. Dan. Thank you. You're a good voice for the people, surely, of upstate New York. And you should go for bigger and better things and should hear your voice loud and clear and affect the good work of, that you do in New York State. Thank you so Thank much, Thank you for Rabbi. coming, Steve. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you.